Welcome to this week's edition of Flashback Friday, your opportunity to get some good review by listening to episodes from the past that Jason has handpicked to help you today in the present and propel you into the future. Enjoy. This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company. For more information and links to all our great podcasts, visit HartmanMedia.com. Speakers, publishers, consultants, coaches, and info marketers unite. The Speaking of Wealth Show is your roadmap to success and significance. Learn the latest tools, technologies, and tactics to get more bookings, sell more products, and attract more clients. If you're looking to increase your direct response sales, create a big-time personal brand, and become the go-to guru, the Speaking of Wealth Show is for you. Here is your host, Jason Hartman. It's my pleasure to welcome Jerry Detweiler. Uh, she has more than 20 years of experience in guiding individuals through the very confusing world of credit, especially business credit, which is going to be one of the topics we will touch on today for sure. And she's earned a reputation as a reliable, independent resource on personal and small business credit. She's the co-author of five books, including her newest title, Finance Your Own Business, Get on the Financing Fast Track, co-authored with best-selling author and corporate attorney Garrett Sutton. Uh, Garrett's been on the show three or four times already over the years. He's a fantastic attorney. He's written many of the Rich Dad books. His co-author that we're interviewing today, Jerry, serves as uh, the head of market education for NAV, which provides uh, business owners with simple tools to build business credit and access lending options based on their credit scores and needs. This is going to be a really good interview today, so thank you for joining us. And Jerry, thank you for joining us. Tell us what's going on in the world of business credit. There are a lot of people out here who make a lot of promises in this area and they don't deliver a lot of times. Do you find that to be true? <laughs> yeah, and well, absolutely. And you know, I, I come from a very practical background. I'm from the Midwest. So <laughs> I'm, not, I, I'm trying to tell it like it is. And I've been around this field for so long. I, I think what's really interesting, Jason, is I do feel like we are sort of at just the beginning of a curve of something big in the business credit space. And I say that because business credit has been so much of a mystery for business owners that it's allowed people to charge sometimes really outrageous fees to business owners who don't know any better. And Garrett gives a great example. He had a client come to him who had paid $85,000 for a shelf corporation that supposedly had about $250,000 in credit available to it. So his idea was, well, I'll pay the $85,000, but then I have $250,000 of credit. I can go do what I want. And it didn't turn out that way at all. In fact, he didn't get the credit lines that were promised and he lost a lot of money. So what's happening So let me, now, let me just explain that to the audience. A shelf corporation, what I believe you're referring to, is a corporation that someone formed and they let it sit on the shelf, didn't use it. And then the promoter said, well, this corporation, I'll sell it to you. It's basically unused, but it has credit lines. And so pay me a huge premium. You know, it might cost 99 bucks to $800 maybe to form that corporation, usually for a new one. But this one's aged, right? And so it has benefits of being aged. And one of those benefits is credit lines. And those credit lines were just not really there, right? Yeah, exactly. And sometimes there are credit, they, they have established some credit lines, and so those are available, but usually it's not just cash credit lines. You know, it might be pieced together that there maybe they had established, you know, a fuel card with a credit line and then another um, one with a, I don't know, Home Depot or uh, for another part of it. It's not usually just a big open line of credit to use for whatever you want. And that's, I think, what people think when they're buying this. I'm not saying there's never an instance where you don't buy a shelf corporation, but you have to be very careful if there's promises that sound too good to be true. And, and also, once that transfers over, sometimes if the lender catches wind of it, they may shut down the credit line that's associated with that corporation. And so you may have to start all over again. But the reason why these are attractive is the word you mentioned, which is aged. And that's because in the business world, we know that there's a high failure rate for small businesses. And so the longer your business has been around, 
you get some credit, so to speak, for the age of the corporation just because they know that if you've made it past that two or five year mark, you have a better chance of succeeding than say one that's just six months old. We will sell no wine before it's time. (laughs) As the saying goes, this is like single malt scotch, you know, it's aged, right? There you go. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And and these corporations, these promoters sell are probably aged in an oak barrel. (laughs) To make it even better. Uh, A lot of our listener base throughout 164 countries worldwide, they're really interested in real estate investing. So you might be thinking, you know, why are you talking about business credit? I don't have my own business. But, you know, a lot of you have or will create an entity like an LLC just to hold real estate. Maybe you'll do that inside a self-directed retirement plan. These are eligible to get business credit that will allow you to do things like buy more property, do more investments, um, spend money for capital improvements on properties, hire people to manage your real estate portfolio. Now, many listeners also own businesses too, but I want to speak to the people who don't think of themselves as business owners, even though technically if they have an entity, they are a business owner, okay? You have a rental property or a real estate investment business, you know, even if you think, well, I don't have an office and I don't need to buy a copy machine or delivery van for my business. That's not what this is about, okay? It could be about that, but that's not really why we're talking about it. We're talking about it because it can be an appealing thing for real estate investors. Yeah, and and let me give you a specific example, Jason, of how this would work. So you have this LLC and you are going to rehab a property. And I had rental properties. We've been through the whole rehab part. And you have a choice. If you don't have the funds available to you immediately, a lot of times what you do is you take your credit card and you go to Home Depot or Lowe's or wherever you're going to go and you buy what you need. And then you put that into the property and then hopefully when you sell it, you can pay that off. Now, if you were to use your LLC to get that credit card through one of these stores and you keep that debt off your personal credit, that helps your credit score because about a third of a credit score, at least those of us who are based in the U.S., about a third of your credit score is the debt you carry and a big portion there is what you're carrying on your credit cards. So if you right now are used to turning to your personal credit cards to fund you know, whatever you're doing for your real estate business, you may be hurting your credit scores. And then you know when you go to the get in that next property, if your personal credit scores are reviewed, then that affects the interest rate you get for the next loan and so on and so on. So the things that you're buying for your business, you can put them in, into business credit. And the better your business credit score that you build the more you can get credit based in the name of the business and eventually you can get it without personal guarantees. So that won't happen immediately, but as you build business credit, you can actually do it without personal guarantees. And I'm sure when Garrett's been on the show, he's talked all about asset protection and protecting your personal assets. And that's ideal for anyone in business, including real estate investors. Okay, so here's a distinction that I I want our listeners to make. A lot of business credit promoters will be out there saying one of the great things about business credit is you can borrow and usually they say it's like $250,000, you know, up to that amount, right, for each entity you have. Mm -hmm. So this is pretty significant potentially, right? And one of the great things about it, they'll say, and I'm going to take issue with this, it's counterintuitive, it's probably counter to what you're thinking too, so feel free to argue with me. But one of the great things about it is it doesn't show up on your personal credit report unless you default. Now, then it will. But I say that that's not necessarily a benefit. It sort of is and it isn't. It's a two-edged sword because if you want to enhance your personal credit, it's good that things show up on your credit report as long as you're, it shows that you can carry a lot of debt and pay it back. That, I believe, enhances your credit score. But, you know, if you don't pay it back, of course, that's not good. (laughs) But, you know, sometimes you actually want it to be on your personal credit report because it will enhance your credit, right? It depends. You know, I really caution about the revolving accounts like credit cards or lines of credit because FICO tells us, and FICO is the main calculator for credit scores in the U.S. Vantage score is the second most common, and both of them take this factor into account. They look at your credit line compared to your uh, balance on each revolving account and then all of them all together. And the best scores go to consumers who use 10% or less of their available credit. Because FICO scores and these scores, what they're doing is they're comparing everyone in the country. And honestly, Jason, 
most people in the country aren't going out and investing in real estate and they aren't doing the kinds of things that your listeners are. And they're rather conservative. They might use their credit card a little bit, but they are. And so when you get out of the normal parameters or the normal patterns, sometimes you can be penalized. So it's not that you can never use a personal credit card for your business, but if you're going to be carrying a high balance, and I mean even 30 to 50% of the available credit, you're better off using a business credit card where it doesn't show up on your personal credit and protecting your personal credit score. Most of those business credit cards, however, are reported to Small Business Financial Exchange, which is a business credit agency, so it will show up there. But as long as you pay on time, you should do okay with those. Okay. So this business credit thing has always been a mystery to me, and it's a mystery to most people, I believe. You know, we all have know on our personal credit report, there's, you know, Experian, Equifax, the other one that just escapes me at the moment. But TransUnion. TransUnion, thank you. I did know that. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I certainly have heard it and said it a million times. I mean, how do you manage your business credit report? Well, that's a great question. And first of all, the reason that Garrett and I wrote this book was exactly because the same confusion that he had heard from his clients. I met Garrett about eight or nine years ago, and he knew of my expertise in credit. We really delved into this business credit and it's evolved a lot during the last few years, even three or four years. So here's the challenge. Business credit reports are very different from personal credit reports. There's no law that says you have to be able to see it once a year for free. There's no law that if there's a mistake, they have to investigate and get back to you in 30 days. There's no law that says if they turn you down because of your credit report that they even have to tell you that. So a lot of people don't even know why they were turned down for small business loans. In addition to writing the book, Finance Your Own Business with Garrett, I also work full-time at a company called NAV, N-A-V dot com, and we're the first company to show business owners their business credit rating for free. So they can come and get two free business credit ratings from us and find out where they stand and then hopefully monitor and build stronger business credit, and we'll match them to lenders that are looking for borrowers with a profile similar to theirs. And then we also have enhanced services if you need more, a deeper dive into your report, or maybe if you're going for an SBA loan, we have a, a service that shows you the FICO score that's used specifically in uh, for small business loans. Yeah, okay. Talk about how we do this. How do we get this business credit, especially speaking, if you would, Jerry, to real estate investors? For example, you know, they're not running a business as most people think of it. You know, they heard Garrett on the show, they set up an LLC, and they want to buy properties inside of that LLC. What do they do to get business credit going? The process is very similar to that of personal credit. It's basically get credit in the name of the business, make sure it reports to the credit bureaus, pay it on time and keep your debt low and you build good credit. You know, it's a similar process. But where it's more confusing is these bureaus are very different. So the main credit bureaus for small business credit are Experian, they have a small business division, Dun & Bradstreet or DNB, which you might have heard of, their Paydex score. And then there's the Small Business Financial Exchange, which says it's not a credit bureau, but it basically collects information from lenders and then lets the member lenders use that information for decision purposes. So it's, for all intents and purposes, very similar to a, a credit bureau. And not everybody reports to all three. So you do need to get accounts with companies that report. And uh, a lot of times the way to start is very simple. So you start with that, you know, with that credit card at your local Staples or Office Depot. You get a fuel card in, in the name of the business. You get a business credit card, a small business credit card. The small business credit card will require a decent personal credit score to obtain but then most of them do not report unless, again, you default. So you're building your business credit that way. And really, with DMB, you need four accounts that are reporting to DMB to develop your Paydex score. So with four accounts, so Dun and Bradstreet, Dun mm-hmm. and Bradstreet is one yep. of the credit reporting agencies. Paydex score. What is, what is Paydex, that? P-A-Y-D-E-X is their main score. Okay. And, so is, um, that, is that analogous to FICO score in the personal it side? It is. Okay. It is. It is. It's very similar. It's their version, although the top score is 100. 
and with a FICO score, your top score is 850. So these run on a very different scale than your personal credit, but they look at the same types of things, you know, payment history and debt. They'd also look at things like how long you've been in business, what industry you're in. So if you are in a risky industry, it's harder to earn a top score. And what's interesting with real estate is, you know, at least a few years ago, very, very tough in that area. But Garrett had some clients who they also set up an LLC to do property management or to do the marketing for their properties. And those entities, because they were not buying and selling real estate, were able to establish a higher score a little bit more quickly just because that industry wasn't considered as high risk. Now, it's definitely improved since 2008, but that is one thing to keep in mind. And if you have multiple entities, each entity can establish its own business credit. It's not a a one-shot thing associated with you. All right. So what else do we need to know about getting this business credit going? We form this entity. How long does it take? Who can help us do it? Do we really have to like become experts in all of this to, to do it? I mean, you know, there's just so much to know. The world is so complicated nowadays. Yeah, <laughs> there's yes. a lot out there. Uh, right. But you know, can can we just hire someone to take care of this for us? I hope you don't mind. I'd say first read our book, <laughs> or listen to it on Audible. It's an or audio listen format. To it on, yeah. Yes, it is. It is on audio and in printed form, and coming on Kindle soon. Just because. And and, I, and by the way, I should say to the listeners, I'm about halfway through it myself, and I have learned a ton of things I did not know. I mean, it's like I said, it's kind of a mysterious world. Yeah, and once you get the basics, you're going to find it's just very similar. It's just we're not familiar with it. Yeah. You know, we're not familiar with these names, the terminology. Interesting little twist uh, with your Paydex score, the DNB score that I mentioned Dun earlier. Dun and Bradstreet Paydex. Dun and Bradstreet okay, yep. score. Mm-hmm. Yes, that particular score, you get the highest score goes to those who pay early. With your personal credit, you don't get any extra credit for paying early, right? You either paid within the 30 days that it was due or you didn't, right? It's That's one or the other. But with these scores, they actually look at uh, something called days beyond term. So they look, did you pay five days after the invoice was due? If that's so, that's five days beyond term. Did you pay 20 days after the invoice was due? And based on that, if you pay early, you can actually get a higher score by paying early. So you can be pretty conservative if you're someone who's very careful and and concerned and conservative about debt, which is understandable, then you can still be conservative. You can still pay your bills on time. You can pay them off in full. You don't have to pay interest, but you do have to have some accounts that are reporting to these credit bureaus in order to be able to establish credit references and establish a business credit rating. Okay, but I have several businesses and I've been in business for a long time. And we have uh, vendors and customers and, you know, people owe us money and we owe people money. I've never reported in any of my businesses how fast or slowly someone pays me. And God, there's a lot of people that owe us some money <laughs> and haven't paid. Mm-hmm. Who, who reports this stuff? Like, I mean, no one's ever asked me to report anyone else that owes me money. Yeah, well, it, it's hard or, for individuals. When individual. I say me, I mean my companies. <laughs> yeah. Right. And it is a little bit, it's jumping through hoops for individuals to get set up to report But absolutely, you know, you get an equipment lease and it could be even an auto lease that you get in the name of the business, you know, commercial auto lease that could be reported. Any business credit card is going to report. A lot of these smaller cards like your fuel cards and your certain retailers that cater to small business. But then also in D&B, a lot of these are businesses that just traditionally have reported. So you may find a printer that you use that will report You may find that when you buy something on terms, it might be some of your supplies for your rehab. That vendor may report. So it's even possible, Jason, that you have a business credit rating for some of your businesses that you just don't know about. Because how would you know unless you checked it? I know, but I can't believe I can't believe the little printer that I use, you know, around the corner is actually reporting. Like that's a whole job for them to manage all of that. I mean, really? You know, well, it may not be the little printer around the corner, but if it's a bigger printer, it very well may. So if you have a bigger commercial printer, they very well may report. Yes. Yeah, interesting. Okay. Yeah. It's this whole ecosystem that we just, unless until you deal with it, you don't know about it. Yeah. Okay. What else do we need to know about establishing this credit? I mean, like in terms of getting someone to do it for us, I think a lot of people are having that question because, you know, many people, maybe like myself, kind of go, oh gosh, you know, throw up your hands. This is so complex. Can I just get someone to handle it? 
You could, certainly can. And if that's your choice, I hold nothing against you. I think there's a lot, I think with the tools that we have now available, there's a lot you can do on your own. And literally, you spend a half an hour, you go into the NAV site, get your credit rating, and then you find some lenders that report and you apply and you get those cards and you start using them. We were talking 30 minutes to get started. So I'd encourage you to at least be aware on your own of what you're doing. Um, rather than just turning it over to someone. But if you do want to turn it over to someone, Garrett and I would be happy to recommend you know, some reliable sources who can help you get it started with a business credit. We're not going to promise you $250,000 in credit overnight or <laughs> anything right. like that. I just think that for most businesses, that's probably not tremendously realistic. Not that it doesn't happen. It certainly does. But I think, you know, you treat this like, like everything else, you know, in your business where, yeah, it's really a pain to have to keep up with my annual corporate filings for my S Corp. I would rather not have to do annual meetings and resolutions and all that stuff. But you know what? (laughs) It comes with the territory. I get the benefits of the business. And so I'm going to keep up with this thing. And I think this, I think business credit is, is along the same lines. Yeah. Okay. All right. You know, I don't exactly know what I should be asking. So just tell us more. I mean, what do people need to know about this? Yeah, well, I would say another thing that you want to keep in mind is that business credit, transitioning to business credit is a process from transitioning from personal credit. And I've had over 20 years working in personal credit. I testified in front of Congress when they were updating some of the credit laws. I'm very, very familiar with what's going on on the on the personal credit side too. And you can't abandon that because it's still very important and it still plays a key role for many business owners, including real estate investors. So you really want to stay on top of it. And again, there's so so many good free tools now. You, You may get your credit score through your credit card company. There are sites, you know, NAV gives a personal credit score, uh, credit.com and Credit Karma and all these other sites. You sign up, you start checking the app, you pay attention to your personal credit score. And that's really important too, especially again, if you're in that process where you need to make a major expenditure and you need to put it on a card, get the funding quickly and then move on, then that's certainly um, something you want to pay attention to. The other thing that re- I think is getting really, really interesting, Jason, is the whole crowdfunding space. Yeah, I'm going to ask you about that. And it's interesting that you have a chapter on this in your book, too, which is exciting. It's sort of odd, though, that that would even come into this conversation. I'm surprised it's in the book, although I like it. It is because it's what I'm seeing is this. there's this interesting blend. First of all, crowdfunding comes in different forms. So you have the reward base, like, you know, music will have their CDs and give you their CD if they raise enough money to produce the CD or a t-shirt or whatever the product may be. But the new one that we have coming out this year is equity crowdfunding. And that's where someone, you know, where you can get investors in your business. So you can actually solicit investors, equity investors. And previously, the SEC has been very strict about if you want to raise money that way, you need to go to accredited investors, wealthy individuals. Yeah. Oh, you can't what advertise. A you know, thing. It's, yeah, it, yeah it's a very, very closed system. Really, really kind of shut out a lot of. Well, other this people. all changed because of the Jobs Act. Tell us uh, what this means now on the equity side of crowdfunding. Right. So, what equity crowdfunding is going to allow is going to allow you to go if you had a business. So, let's say I just heard from someone who has this really cool real estate app and she's going to crowdfund it. So, she could either offer rewards or she could go to one of these internet portals. And this is a true story because I just heard from her last week. And she could go to one of these portals and she could advertise her offering and try to get investors, you know, people who would become shareholders as opposed to just getting a reward in the company. And this is actually happening in Q2 of this year, 2016. So it's right around the corner. But here's where it gets interesting for business owners. What I'm seeing is this whole, we're starting to see this blend of companies that are doing sort of a a blend of credit and crowdsourcing. So you have some lenders like KivaZip has 0% loans. They're small loans. So most real estate investors probably would not be using this unless maybe they were doing some kind of community project. I'm a Kiva lender. I mean, I love it. I just simply do it for a good cause. And interestingly, according to Kiva, if they're telling the truth, but you know, I just want to make that disclaimer, their loan repayment rate is like 98.4%. So I just figure that's better than putting my money in the stock market. 
Yeah, no, <laughs> and I, I can actually too. do some good I in the world. You know? I just, so, you know, I say yeah. I support small businesses. Yeah. I want to put my money where right. my mouth is exactly. and support these small businesses. But you know, like Kiva Zip, and there's some other platforms like this. They actually make you start and raise money first from your community and your network, and then once you've raised a little bit of money, it, it's not always a lot, but once you've you've shown that community support, then the lenders come in. And you can fully fund a loan. Now, in Kiva, they're getting lenders from all over, like you and me, who are supporting the platform. But there's other lenders where there might be institutional money. So what this here's what this means for small business owners. And I don't care whether it's real estate or anything else. I think your reputation is becoming so crucial. Mm-hmm. And it's going to affect you in so many more ways than we've ever realized. You know, right. someone in, in personal credit, they can't use your Facebook comments or your friends or anything for personal credit. It's too regulated. With business credit, they can. They can look at things like your Yelp ratings or your your Facebook network or your LinkedIn Mm, network or your tweets, you know, all that stuff. If you think you were overwhelmed just thinking about business credit, (laughs) Mm -hmm. now you've got this whole reputation to maintain. But I really, that's the direction we're moving right now in the small business lending arena. Yeah, interesting. Very interesting. So you're saying, I mean, employers have been doing this, you know, looking at social media and stuff. And there are some uh, laws state by state. I know that uh, California has uh, made some restrictions on them doing that. So, you know, those drunken Facebook photos, you can't be used against you in hiring process and so forth. Yeah, you know, it's good that people's reputations follow them around. I mean, I think that's kind of the way it should be, right? It goes back to the very early days of lending where it was your character, right? Right. You you knew the banker, everybody in town knew you, and they knew whether you were likely to repay. But we moved away with all this data. Now, yeah, the data is sort of coming back in a new way to vouch for your character and the likelihood that you are to repay. But it's also cool because those who might not have strong personal credit may have other options that keep a zip opportunity that I, we just talked about. They don't look at a, a credit score. Mm-hmm. That's not even a factor. So if you've messed up and you're starting over, there are options out there that may overlook a bad personal credit score provided you either have business credit or you have community willing to support you as you get back on your feet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good stuff. Give out your website, you know, the books on Amazon, Audible, et cetera. What is your website, Jerry? Yeah, so the book is available at Corporate Direct, corporatedirect.com, and there's a business credit tab right there on the top, and we also have a free report on the stages of business credit that you can download for free there. And then if you want to check your um, business credit scores, you'll see a link right on that same business credit page on Corporate Direct, or you can go directly to nav, nav.com and get your free business credit scores and uh, get started establishing credit. And, you know, Garrett and I love to help. So certainly questions could be fodder for a new article or something else that we can help with. So I encourage you to reach out to us through the Corporate Direct site. Fantastic. Jerry Detweiler, thank you so much for joining us and talking to us about this little known area that's becoming more and more important. And there are some good opportunities here. So it's good to know more about it. My pleasure. This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company, all rights reserved. For distribution or publication rights and media interviews, please visit www.hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own, and the host is acting on behalf of Platinum Properties Investor Network, Inc., exclusively.